All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. This is God's good word and his gospel to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this scripture that testifies of your mercy to us in Christ. We pray as Pastor Herb preaches that you would fill him with your spirit, that you would help us to hear your word, that we might know you and long to follow you more closely to bring praise and glory to your name above all. In Jesus' name, amen. People keep asking me, what, is, what do you think you're going to be doing during your retirement? And I, my answer is the same to everybody. I just don't know. Uh, but we're not going anywhere. And uh, last night was just such a special time. For those of you that were there, it, uh, thank you so much. And uh, for those of you that are here, delight to be here one more time. Actually, three more times after tonight, or this morning. Um, the, uh, this past year, we, have, we went through half of the Gospel of Mark, then we stopped and we did the letter to Peter, and then we finished the Gospel of Mark uh, just last week. And um, so what does a retiring pastor preach on when he has four more, four more sermons to preach? That's what I've been struggling with over the last couple months, knowing that this time was going to arrive. And so uh, I think I took the advice of one of my dear elders and said, well, preach on what you like. And I like to preach about grace. And so these last four messages that I have for you are going to be about grace, about God's gift to us in, in four categories. We're going to talk about, um, today we're going to talk about forgiveness. Next week we're going to talk about um, family on Mother's Day. Next, the time after that we'll be talking about fortitude it has, you know, it's really endurance, but I want to make it four F's, okay? And the last one will be about faith. I'm not really into alliteration in all these years, you know that, but this last, you know, you never know what you have to expect from me. So the, the, this last series is going to be an alliterative one of, of four great demonstrations of God's grace to us. And I want to thank Mary Ann Danko so much. She... She started this thing back in December, and I, I got to tell you, I was a little embarrassed when she asked you to, to sign up in, in December for something that was going to happen in April, but um, it, it, it turned out great. And she, and she asked me, what, Herb, what's your favorite Bible verse? And, and it took me a while, a little while to think about that. Um, for Shelly and I, it has it is been, through most of, our, most of my Christian life, she was a believer way before me, but uh, it was Romans 8.28. You may, you've heard me talk about that, and I'm going to talk about that uh, the, the 22nd of May. Our oldest son was, was chronically ill for about five years in the middle of my conversion to Christ, and, and uh, that verse meant so much to us as a family for Shelly and I. It just helped, kept us going through that very difficult time in our lives. But over the years, I have come to believe that my favorite Bible verse is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. It is to me the great verse that describes the gospel. And so I have tried to preach from this pulpit from the time we started here at Covenant of Grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, the, go the gospel of God's amazing love 
an amazing grace which we'll sing about as we end the service today. But what is it about this verse that I love so much? It is because it gets to the heart of the work of Jesus. It gets to the heart in one sentence of the whole history and story of the Bible. The Bible is the story of redemption. How God who created us for himself, and though we turned away from him, had a plan to bring us back. And that is the story of the Bible. You can look at some places and it says, it says that shall, shall not do this and shall not do that. Well, God says that because he loves us. The shall nots are there because he cares about us and wants our best. But the story of the Bible is the story of a God who, who has redeemed sinners to himself. And that's been the message that's been from this pulpit and I know will continue after I'm gone. Would you say, well, forgiveness, it's not even mentioned in the text. No, it's not. But it is all, all over the text. And I'm going to share some of my story. I mean, you know, I, I've, I've been a Christian for 45 years. I can remember. All I have to do is look at my youngest son and know how old he is. Pardon me if you didn't know his birth date, but now you do. So uh, he, he won't mind, I don't think. He's very young for his age. But anyway, you know, he, he, he came to be born a, a month after I was born again. And so I know exactly how long I've been uh, knowing Jesus as my Savior personally. And, and so... In my own story, forgiveness was such an important part of that evening. And, you know, your story, your, 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 your um, faith story, I was talking with some people last night, you know, maybe there was a crisis in your life, maybe it was this or that. For me, it was a, a crisis of forgiveness. I needed to be forgiven, I knew that in my heart, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. But what we're talking about this, this morning with forgiveness and grace is that restoring relationships requires the grace of forgiveness. It's my first grace sermon. There'll be four of them. Grace and forgiveness go hand in hand. Now let me define grace, and I'm, you know that I use the, the Greek psalm uh, here, not because I'm a Greek scholar, but I did speak slave through that in seminary, and it, I'm thankful for it. Um, grace is a word that means um, unmerited favor. It's undeserved. It's not something that you can earn or be worthy of. It's, it's very close to the meaning of the word gift. Different, but it's, it's very much close to the, the word gift. And as I have shared with you over these many years, the number one need that we have, every person needs, is to be reconciled to God. Peace with God is the most important thing that we can have. It's the title of Billy Graham's first and greatest book, Peace with God. It's what his ministry was all his career. And so I hope people could say that it's also been something that I have proclaimed faithfully through my career. We need to go back to Genesis. We need to go back to understand this story of redemption. We need to understand that God created us, not because he was lonely, but because he wanted to use us and wanted to experience relationship with us. And so he created us like himself. The Bible says in, in Genesis 1.26 that we were created in God's image. And what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but I'm going to say, first of all, it means that we're personal. God is personal. He's not some force out there. He is personal. He's a person that we can relate to and talk to and, and, and relate, relate to. God is also um, relational. The Trinity is a demonstration of the fact that God had love with himself even before he created us. But he created us to have a relationship with us. And the other thing about God that's also true of us is that God is moral. God has a sense of right and wrong. And he's put in every heart a sense of right and wrong. Now that can be distorted, and the Bible explains that pretty well. But that's an um, another important aspect that we must understand in terms of relationships. And you know when in a relationship when someone hurts you. You know in a relationship when someone has wronged you. 
You know when someone has done something bad to you. We know these things because we're moral beings. And so does God. And so the problem with us is, man, is that, well, our first parents wanted to be just like God. They wanted to know everything. They wanted to be everything. And they wanted to be independent of God. And so that first sin was wanting to be like God. And so all of us struggle with that every day. I do. You do. We all like to go our own way. And there are things in the Bible that say things we shouldn't do, and we want to do them anyway. And, and we live the consequences of those things. Sin entered the world through man's disobedience, and man became self-centered, not God-centered. At age 28, my character, I would say, was very self-centered. I shared my testimony with two Moroccan Christians years ago, and the translator had a little difficulty with me sharing that, that I told them my, my basic sin was being self-centered. They didn't really know how to say that in, in Arabic, I don't think. They kind of worked that. They thought maybe that, you know, I had, had a drug problem or I was beating my wife or something like that. Now, my wife beats me. No, that's not true. <laughs> Where are you, Shelly? You're not sitting in your usual place. <laughs> you know you can't control what I'm going to say. <laughs> so I did it. But you zapped me twice last, yesterday, so I, you, you had it coming. She loves me anyway. We, we, we can do this, you know. We, we, never mind. I, I, I promise not to say another thing about you the rest of the sermon, okay? She's shaking her head yes, but she knows it may not be true. I have that problem too. I, no, I'm sorry. Um, at age 28, I was a very self-centered person. I had my own goals. I had my own ambitions. I pr kind of wanted to do everything my, my own way. And that's who I was. And, but people wouldn't have understood me to be that kind of person. I, you know, I went to church regularly. I sang in the choir. I was even on a paid youth ministry staff. I didn't do anything spiritual. I just led the, the, the recreation, which is kind of my forte. But um, that's where I was. I didn't know Jesus personally. A personal God wants us to know him personally. And in the providence of God, we went to a different church, and, and I was surprised two people from that church visited us, knocked on our door. I mean, I never heard of such a thing. And they came in, and they asked some really not annoying questions. I wouldn't say that was, that was not true, but, you know, they asked me some questions I couldn't answer. The first question was this, if you die tonight, would you know for certain you're going to heaven? And I think I'm a pretty honest person. And I said, no, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I said, okay, well, can we ask you another question? I said, all right. What would you say to God if you, if, you were, if you went to heaven and you stood before God and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And as I, I, I could tell you exactly what I said. And it wasn't an answer to the question <laughs> as I've analyzed it. I said, well, I hope that before I died, I would be able to say that I was sorry for my sins. See, I grew up in a church, and I'm, I'm thankful for that, very thankful for that. I knew what sin was. I, I believed that there was a heaven. But I didn't know how to be sure of that. And one of those men said, well, we have good news for you. And they sure did. And in the next 20 minutes, they explained the fact that God was, was gracious and forgiving, but he was just, and you can't, heaven is a free gift, it can't be earned or deserved, and Jesus paid the price for me to be able to get into heaven. I, I had never heard it put that way before. I probably had heard it, but I just, it didn't, it didn't sink in, it didn't, I didn't understand it. But over the years, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 to me, explains it in the most concise and precise and simplistic way. So it is my favorite verse. There are four key words. 
And you know, words are powerful. They really are. Words can change your life. We need to be careful with our words, what we say. Sometimes you can say something that a person may never forget, may hurt them for the rest of their lives. And so we should be careful what we say. But the four key words in this, in this passage are the words grace, saved, gift, and faith. Now, I've already defined grace. Grace in the Bible primarily talks about un, unmerited favor. It's undeserved. It's not something that you've earned. Next, ver, next word is, uh, is the word saved. Now, you've never heard me, well, probably, I don't think you've heard me, say, brother, are you saved? You know, some churches do that. Some pastors do that. I, you know, I've never cared for that. Not that it's wrong. I just have never cared for it because my response is, saved from what? You know, that, that's kind of the question that comes after that. And so, mm, are you saved? Well, it depends. What does that mean? You know, you, there's more to it than that. So I haven't used that term, but you know, it's fair because it's in the Bible. <laughs> it's right here in Ephesians 2, verse 8. The, uh, you know, and I share with you the Greek words because it just kind of um, reinforces what the text says. And, and uh, the, the, the Greek word, the little Greek word is the word sozo. Four letters. Little short little word. Sozo. And it means in context. In the Greek culture, it meant, and the Greeks would have understood it means you're rescued from harm. Preacher, would you just say... Brother, are you rescued from harm? Now, I want to go a step further, because you know I like, I like Greek grammar. You know, I took 11 hours of Greek, and it was hard for me. I, I was never a language student. French class was the hardest thing I ever took in school or in college. Those of you that are, that are language people, I really admire you, okay? But I, I worked hard in Greek, and, but if, if I had only... It was worth driving 900 miles and selling all my... All, all we had, and learning Greek for one thing, and that is to learn the past perfect tense of Greek. And that's what this little sozo word is. You add the first two letters, so it's sozo, is a perfect tense verb. So if you understand it that way, it means it's happened in the past, it is happening in the present, and it will happen in the future. And I, I've studied most of the words saved and salvation in the New Testament, and they're all put in the perfect tense, in the original language. So I want to reread that verse for you in my new amplified version of the verse. For it is by unmerited favor that you have been rescued from the punishment from past sins, present sins, and sins that you will do in the future. That little word, and understanding that little bit of Greek, gives you a tremendous amount of theology. Because it talks about this precious doctrine that I love so much called eternal security. And that once a person has Jesus in their life, they are secure because their past sins have been paid for, their present sins have been paid for, and their future sins are going to be paid, have been paid for. That doesn't mean that the consequences of your sin on earth don't, don't apply. They do. You lie, you steal, you're going to get the results of that, but it won't affect your eternal destiny. And that's what this verse is about. This ver verse is about your eternal destiny. For it is by unmerited favor you have been rescued from punishment that you really deserve for your sins. Now, I had an interesting experience. I've shared this with many of you over the years. Most people, if you ask them, are they going to go to heaven? They'll say, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. And the analogy, even though they don't analyze it this way, is a balance scale. That if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you're going to heaven. I'm currently teaching an ethics class at the Baltimore, um, Metro Baltimore Seminary, and there's an Iraqi refugee in the class. 
And he's got a lot of questions, and he's got a lot of opinions. And I shared this analogy last week in the class, and he says, yeah, I was a Muslim. That's exactly what Islam teaches. Well, okay. I've never been to Iraq, so I believe you. You're, you're a smart guy, okay. This idea of a balance scale? Well, let me tell you a story. When I was in college, for my major, I had to take two, two lab sciences, two, four semesters, and one of the classes I had to take was physics. It wasn't my first choice, but I took it. And the second semester, I got a B plus in physics. A B plus? Guess what my percentage was? 63%. <laughs> in most classes, that's a failure. And I got a B plus. Now, you can make several conclusions about that. One is that the, the teacher probably knew he wasn't getting across what he should have been teaching. Or he had a very low standard. What's God's standard for his heaven? You see, that's the problem with works. If you're going to get there by working, how hard do you have to work? How good do you have to be? How many good deeds do you have to outweigh the bad deeds? Well, I'd rather not try to figure that out. I'd rather just look and see what Jesus says. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 5, verse 48 of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh oh. Uh oh, Herb Ruby's in trouble. <laughs> I was talking to my brother last night, telling the, the rotten things that I did to him as a kid, and so he, he knows I'm not perfect. Amen, Doug? Amen, yeah. Yeah, we don't have any argument about that. So if, if, if perfection is the standard, we're all in trouble. But God, in His mercy, you know that passage that Mark read for us a little bit ago. But because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. Mercy is another description of the word grace. You know, mercy is a gift. You don't earn mercy. It's given on, because you don't deserve it or it wouldn't be called mercy. In my theological studies, I had the, the privilege of reading a book by an 11th century bishop. His name was Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury. And he wrote, I believe, to be the most important book in the Middle Evil, medieval time. In Latin, it's Cur, David, uh, Cur Deus Homo. And in English, it would be, Why did God create man? Noah, that's wrong. That's, forget that, forget that, sorry. Cordes homo means why God became man, sorry. Why God became man. Here's what Anselm thought. God is holy, God is righteous in all his ways. His standard is perfection, so, God, so man has a problem, but God has a problem. You know, how is he going to be merciful but also be just? How is he going to, to, to give us eternal life but also punish the sin that we deserve to be punished with? How can he stay just and also be loving? And here's what Anselm came up with. All right. Sacrifices, the Old Testament sacrifices had a purpose. We understood that for forgiveness of sin. Anselm determined that in order for God to be satisfied, for a man's sin to be forgiven, a man had to be the sacrifice. Animal sacrifices weren't good enough. And not only did the man, but had to be a man to be a sacrifice, but had to be a perfect man. But what about how, would that be one for one? Okay, but how about for all mankind? And so Anselm said that, man, that one man who is perfect has to be of infinite value. Infinite value. So that person has to be God's son. 
Anselm explained the incarnation better than anybody, I think, ever. Why did, why did God send His Son? Why did the second person of the Trinity take on flesh and become a man? Well, to live a perfect life, so we could get credit for that, but also to be the perfect sacrifice that none of us could offer. And so Jesus gave His life to satisfy the justice of God. So God could be loving and merciful, but also keep his and maintain his justice. Our faith is a reasonable faith. It is not a leap in the dark. I think Anselm's reasoning to this is very important for us to understand who Jesus was and why he came. Jesus was the gift. Jesus brought us unmerited favor. And so, he was the Lamb of God, as John John the Baptist said, that takes away the sin of the world. So we've covered the word grace, we've covered the word um, um, grace, and um, the other other two (laughs) words, and we're now to the fourth word, which is faith, okay, faith. If forgiveness is offered as a gift, it must be personally received. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. For it, is by, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not of yourself. It's not a gift, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. This gift must be received as any gift. You know, I could have a gift up here for you. I don't, but... <laughs> I could, no, I could. I pretend, well, you could have this bottle of water, okay? That'd be, no, that's not enough. That's not really a gift. I'm, I could have a gift, but it wouldn't be yours until what? You actually received it. So the idea that is in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is that this gift must be received, and we receive that, faith, or that, that gift by faith. I listened to these two men share this story with me, and, and they came to the point and says, does this make sense to you? Do you believe that you're a sinner? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? Do, you? do you believe that he died for you and that you can have eternal life through him by faith? And I said, wow, that's the best news I ever heard. And they said, would you like to pray? And I said, yes. And I prayed some prayer asking Jesus to come into my life. And here I am, 45 years later. That's not to say that every person who's going to have that experience is going to be a preacher. No, no. That's, that's, but... For all of us to be in heaven, we need to have that faith and that trust. So I received that, and here I am 40, 45 years later. And I have tried every Sunday to say that message some way, somehow. Whether it's in the actual liturgy of the, the worship time or the sermon or whatever. Do you have that faith in your heart? Do you have Jesus in your heart? There's nothing more that I would want for any of you here than to have that. Because I want to see all of you someday in heaven. You know, talk about a reunion. It won't be a retirement party. It'll be the feast of Jesus. It'll be the great supper of the Lamb that we'll experience together, and I want us all to have that. And so I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep saying that whether I'm retired or not, okay? But there's one more thing that I want to say to you before I conclude. How do you know that your faith is real? How do you know that your faith in Jesus is real? Well, I'm going to just give you two. There, there are probably ten answers to that question, but I'm just going to mention two. One is I hope you will believe the promises of Scripture. That what God says is true. And when Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 57, believe, he who believes has eternal life, he was talking about believing in him. And it's as simple as that. He who believes in me as your Savior, as the one who paid for your sins, who is your Lord, you'll have eternal life. It's as simple as that, but it's, it's as hard as... Well, it's impossible without the Lord working in our hearts. 
But one, one, one other thing, one other way that I think we can know for certain that we have eternal life, or that we, we're forgiven, I'm sorry, we're forgiven. Can you forgive others? Can you forgive others? Now, when I want to define forgiveness, you don't forgive a person for slighting you, okay? Slights, you can just wash over. Someone is late 20 minutes to, your, to, to an appointment, that's a slight, okay? You don't have to forgive them for that, really. Say, okay. If they lied to you why they, why they didn't, why they were late, then that's another story. That's a hurt. Lies are hurts. Lies are a demonstration of mistrust and, and, and so forth. And so that's another story. I'm talking about hurts. Can you forgive someone who hurts you? I started with forgiveness because I knew that evening that I needed forgiveness. I knew that I had broken God's commands over and over again. And I pushed him away so many times. And every time, it was a hurt to him. Because he created me for relationship with him, as he has created all of you for relationship with him. So I needed forgiveness. I wanted forgiveness. And that night when I was offered to me, I just grabbed it. And, and maybe that's not your sense of need. Maybe there are other things. But for me, that's what it was. And that's why I'm sharing with you t- today, in this last of four sermons, why forgiveness is so important to me. But over the years, as was mentioned last night, I've done 85, 85 weddings. And I've tried, if possible, to have six sessions with every couple now, or at least six hours of counseling, because I think that's just, that's just good, good advice, and, and I was able to help, I hope, a lot of people in their marriages. But I, don't, I think a lot of people don't understand forgiveness. They've been told, you know, just forgive and forget. That's not forgiveness. I was thinking about that, and I've never shared this story with you, so it's a fresh story after 40-some years, or 40, 39 years. When I was five years old, I remember playing in front of my grandmother's house on West Main Street in in Westminster, on on the concrete, with my little truck. I had a little truck, and I was playing. I was five years old, I was playing. And this kid up the street, who's twice my size, took my truck away from me. He said, I'll give it back to you for a nickel. I don't know why, but I had a nickel on me. See, nickels in those days could buy a candy bar. That was worth a lot. What do they cost now? $1.89? <laughs> you talk about how old I am. No. A nickel. And so I remember this kid extorting me for a nickel. That was <clears throat> 68 years ago. You don't forget the hurts. You don't. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Do you think for a minute that God has forgotten all our sins? Does God have amnesia? Does he have some kind of a miraculous amnesia? No, he knows everything. So what is his forgiveness? He treats us as if we haven't sinned because he punished Jesus instead for us. That's why I'm so amazed at his grace and continue to be, even at this tender age, at this point in my life, I will always be thankful for the forgiveness that comes through God's gift of Jesus on the cross for me. Well, what is forgiveness then? Forgiveness is that God doesn't treat us as as we deserve. He treats us, he has made a choice not to punish us but to treat us as his perfect child and give us eternal life with him. No, God doesn't forget. God knows all things. Now what about you? Can you forgive? You know, this, this verse that I... Try to teach every couple that I do a marriage for. It's two chapters later in Ephesians. It's verse 32 of chapter 4, where Paul encourages Christians, be kind and compassionate to one another. 
forgiving each other just as Christ. God in Christ has forgiven you. You see, if you know how much God has forgiven you, if you're honest with yourself and look at that perspective, how many thousands of times have you turned away from God or done your own way or been unkind to someone else or done something that you know is against his, his, his commands? How many? And yet God doesn't count a single one against you if you have Jesus. So if God can do that, can you forgive one hurt? Can you? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And in your ability to forgive because Jesus has forgiven you, God and Jesus has forgiven you, you have the power to forgive others. Now, this deserves a whole series, and I'm out of time. But the principle I hope you will understand. If God has forgiven you all of that, you certainly can forgive someone else. Not that you will forget, but you will say, I will not punish you. I will not say unkind things about you behind your back. I will not shun you. I will not do this or that. And it's complicated. I know that. I'm not trying to oversimplify. Life is complicated. But God's forgiveness of us is not. He has punished Jesus in our place, and so if we believe in Jesus, we would do not stand in his, in his wrath or his desire to punish us. We've already been punished in, in Jesus, and so he treats us now as if we're perfect in him. I wanted to say one thing last night, so I get to say it now. I forgot. We have an amazing God who loves us so much that he would send his son to die for us. That's the bottom line. It's been the bottom line for me. I hope it's the bottom line for you. God loves us that much. And no matter who you are or what you are or what you've struggled with, you can know that forgiveness. And if you know that forgiveness, you can give it to others. God took a very flawed football coach, and changed his heart through Jesus. That's proof that he can change you and help you, help you grow by his amazing grace. Shall we pray? Father, I will be forever thankful for you sending Jesus for me. And I hope everyone in this audience is thankful for you, to, you sending Jesus for them. For you are a God of mercy and of love. But may we never forget that you are holy and just. We wouldn't want you really any other way. Not really. Thank you for your provision for us. I pray that we would be people who can live in the light of your forgiveness. And that each and every day we would be thankful for that. But we would also examine our hearts. And look at people that we haven't forgiven. And in that, we would be able to say, Jesus, because you've forgiven me, I can forgive that person. And may we be free from hurt and from those pains that come with that. And look forward to the day, Jesus, when we will see you face to face. May this be the desire of every heart. And we pray in Jesus' name.